these are technologies that are starting to, to absolutely mature. The laser weapons themselves are becoming more efficient, uh, more compact. We already see lasers being used from the ground to uh, target satellites in, in space. We will have uh, fewer people in the battlefield, you know, more robots, more autonomy. If deployed en masse, it could start to have an important tactical impact, which could have strategic implications. High energy lasers uh, are kind of subset of what we call directed energy weapons, which is, you know, sounds very science fiction, but it is actually something that a lot of countries around the world and their militaries are investing heavily in. We've used lasers in one form or another for a long, a long time in the military. They're used for kind of range, laser range findings, or they're used for guiding a, you know, a, a precision guided bomb or missile onto its target. And so it's not completely new that we, we do use them in the military, but what is new is that we're using them as an actual form of attack. This new class of lasers relies on electrical energy. Uh, that is fed into special materials that creates uh, photons, which, you know, it's light. Um, those photons are kind of uh, focused into a beam, right? And then they said that beam is, uh, is aimed at a particular target. Um, and uh, so when the beam hits a target, there, you know, there's different kinds of effects that, uh, that the lasers can produce uh, depending on, you know, the, the part of the military that's using it. It can be more destructive, so it can, you know, actually be seeking to effectively burn a hole through the, the, the wing of the drone that you're going after or, or whatever other sort of targets it is. The, the sort of, I suppose, the, the benefits and the, uh, of such a system is that obviously it moves literally at the speed of light, so the, the kind of time for engagement is very quick. You do need to keep it on target for a little while. Like it's not a completely instantaneous effect. It, you know, it can take a second or two. So you do need to make sure you're tracking and, and keeping on target for that time. And obviously you are limited to it being in line of sight because obviously light goes in a straight line. So you can't do things over the horizon. But the advantage is that you can potentially engage things within the horizon very quickly and then move to other targets, engage those very quickly and crucially do so in a way that is very low cost. So we have seen, you know, in certain conflicts around the world, very expensive, say, Patriot missiles, which is a kind of US produced, very high end um, air defense missile able to deal with fast moving threats at high altitudes. You're not, you know, you're not firing a, a missile, for example, that's worth hundreds of thousands or even millions of pounds. You're doing something that the, the MOD in the UK says can be, you know, 10 pounds a shot, 15, 20 pounds a shot. So radically, radically cheaper. The main advantage that people usually talk about is this idea of an infinite magazine, right? So if you use traditional kinetic weapons like bullets, Right, you've got a finite number of bullets that you can fire, and once you're out of ammunition, that you know you're kind of done. And so, with lasers, uh, the idea is as long as you have them plugged into an electrical source, uh, you know you can keep on firing. Right. So now, that's uh, that's not quite true. It's not infinite. And so, what usually happens is that um, you know you run out of electrical power. Right. But but the idea certainly is that it gives you more bullets, if you like. Uh, compared to traditional weapons, um, you know, one of the main challenges is uh, is heating, right? So what we call thermal management. So these devices get really hot. So typically, these high energy lasers are about fifty percent uh, efficient in terms of converting electrical power into you know an energy and beam uh, power. So then, so where does the other fifty percent go? Right, you're 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 using fifty percent in the way you want to. You've got some other fifty percent to deal with. And most of that 50% power uh, goes into heating. And so if you have, um, you know, this would be quite a high power device, but if you had a 100 kilowatt laser, you've got to deal with 50 kilowatts of heating, which is a tremendous amount of heating. Laser beams can be um, diminished and, and altered and affected, degraded uh, by a number of different environmental effects. Um, you know, when we fly in, in airplanes, you sometimes hit turbulence, right? And the airplane kind of gets moved around. And so turbulence can um, affect um, uh, laser beams even on a nice weather day. Um, but then on a not nice weather day, if it's raining, if it's snowing, if there's mist, if there's fog, all of those things can degrade the effectiveness as, of a laser beam. And then in a battlefield, you know, there's all kinds of stuff, right? There's explosions, there's smoke, uh, you know, um, it's a very dirty um, environment. And so again, those effects, um, 
can diminish the effectiveness of, of laser systems. One of the other challenges in using laser weapon systems um, are uh, collateral damage and what's called deconfliction. If you fire a, a, la a high power energy uh, laser beam um, into the sky, I mean, it can go for 100 kilometers, right? And, and so there's the danger that you're aiming at a drone and, and you miss it. Uh, well, where does the, that laser beam go? Uh, you can be aiming at the drone and the laser beam can reflect off of surfaces of uh, the drone or anything else. So where does that reflect light go? And certainly there's a, one of the main concerns is about uh, blinding people, right? Damaging people's eyesight through uh, not direct laser beam, um, you know, incidents, but reflected uh, beam incidents. So that picture you kind of described there of, you know, hundreds of drones and hundreds of uh, laser beams all shooting in, you know, a, in the sky. Um, it, it sounds like science fiction. It's technologically possible. But all of this uh, side effects, right, um, should be taken into account. They, they have invested heavily in air defense to try and protect both their military kind of uh, bases and forces, but also their civilian population. Um, they have kind of very layered defenses with, with kind of various missile based systems. Um, so the iron dome is the famous one, but there are others. Um, and they do have sort of certain geographical advantages in terms of how they defend themselves. Cause they are ultimately a very small country, um, and they know where the threats are coming from. So they are able to protect, you know, a relatively small a area with quite a high density of, of weapons, but still the kind of volume of threat that they face uh, in from air and missile and drones has meant that it's, it's really stretched them in terms of their stockpiles of, of interceptor missiles and, and so on. And so we, we, you know, we saw that in the exchange of missiles back and forth with Iran, uh, although Israel was ultimately very successful in its engagement with Iran, still things did sort of get through and it was costing the Israeli state very large amounts of money to keep up even, you know, a couple of days of high temp tempo air defense operations. So this is where things like iron beam come in it is. Again, it's not a silver bullet solution to dealing with all threats, but it gives them another tool, another layer to so that layer defense. You know, those ranges and power levels that uh, you described uh, are just right for the geography that Israel has to defend, right? It tends to be relatively short range um, rockets and missiles that are being fired at them. 100 kilowatts will certainly, you know, if it's uh, held on a target for enough time, will certainly, uh, you know, uh, disable someone else's missile. It's really the integration of a laser into, uh, you know, an integrated air defense system, uh, for, uh, protection against, uh, missiles and rockets and drones. That's probably where, uh, Israel is ahead of any other nation in the world. Um, and so it's going to be interesting to see, you know, how effective it is. The situation in the Ukraine is somewhat similar to Israel that, uh, drone warfare is, you know, is becoming more and more important and and effective, you know, and, and, and I think again, this is part of the military, which is technologies get developed, but then as the military use of those technologies evolves as well. And so we've seen drones used very effectively, uh, by on both sides, right. In that conflict. And so you can certainly understand Ukraine's desire. Um, again, to have this sort of infinite magazine capability, things like direction your energy weapons, if deployed on mass. It could start to have, you know, a, a sort of an important tactical impact, which could have strategic implications. So what I mean by that is that, you know, currently we see, say in Ukraine, a real challenge on the case of the defenders, um, to deal with incoming threats. There's just too many of them, um, whether they're targeting, you know, military targets or whether they're going after civilian populations, cities like Kyiv and Lviv, it's very easy for defenders to get overwhelmed by saturation attacks because the enemy can just throw so much stuff at them. So there are some sort of inherent advantages at the tactical level to, to offense in that sense. But if you get a new uh, defensive system like directed energy weapons, it potentially kind of swings that pendulum back towards the defender and gives you new ways of protecting yourself, protecting civilian populations, protecting your military forces. And suddenly drones and other things are not quite the sort of threat that they, they currently are. And, and we're always going to see that swing back and forth because people will then obviously come up with countermeasures to those weapons and countermeasures to the countermeasures to those weapons and so on. But I think absolutely at the tactical level, it could shift the offense defense balance. We've talked really about lasers for destroying things, right? Really burning holes and 
and uh, other systems. But they are also used um, and have been used for a long time for something called dazzling. And so dazzling is when you shine a laser into someone else's sensor. And so systems like that are already deployed on large aircraft um, to defeat uh, heat-seeking missiles. So if there's a heat-seeking missile, you know, going towards a, a large airplane, it has uh, low uh, low power level uh, lasers that shine into the sensor of, of that missile and blind it. So it's the same thing for satellites, right? Satellites, um, one of the main things satellites are used for is looking down at the earth, especially military satellites, right? And, and so uh, without destroying the satellite, um, it is potentially possible to, to dazzle uh, those, uh, those sensors on spacecraft uh, from the ground. Again, it's a pretty high energy uh, laser that would be needed because it's a long way it has to go. There's a diplomacy element to it, right? That, that is one thing to, to burn a hole in a satellite. It's a very different thing to just dazzle it, to degrade it. And so uh, there's that element to the use of lasers uh, against uh, spacecraft. You know, there are other technologies that are also coming in. Things like obviously AI, you know, increasing autonomy because a lot of a lot of drones are still actually remotely piloted, but having them, you know, automated and autonomous in future could make a big difference. Things like quantum technologies could change how we sense things in the battlefield, but also you know the way our computers work and the way we can make decisions and anticipate the adversary. And then there are lots of other weapons like hypersonics or things in space or cyber or whatever that again could could change things. So really the question is how all these things will combine uh, and also who's going to come up with the best tactics for for using them and also the industrial base to, to produce them at scale to get advantage. So the UK, I think, is is absolutely one of the countries that is is kind of near the, the front of that pack, though. You know, we've seen successful testings of, of Dragonfire. Um, there's been a big emphasis in the Strategic Defence Review in 2025 on the UK developing advantage in a number of technology areas, um, not just direct and anywhere energy weapons, but they were called out as one of particular focus for the UK. Um, and they are seen as a, a potential way, not just of filling urgent capability gaps in UK uh, military kind of capability. So things like defending the UK, you know, airspace, but also a way, you know, of, of supporting NATO allies for deploying these to places like Estonia, or of course, potentially, you know, um, giving them or, or selling them to, to countries like Ukraine that might need them as well. So I think the UK is in a, is a really good pos position. It's got a lot of expertise through DSTL, which is the Defence Science Technology Laboratory. And there's a consortium of, of kind of uh, UK companies that are then involved in developing these weapons. Um, I suppose really the, the, the kind of key message that came out of the strategic defense review is that we need to kind of get beyond that valley of death, that, that, which is the, this idea that we often come up with great ideas, not just in the UK, but in lots of, lots of countries, but it's, can you get them actually into service, actually commercialized, actually deployed and in the hands of military users, or do they get bogged down in bureaucracy and testing and production and all of those sorts of pitfalls that, that can occur. So that's where we're really at right now, the sort of technology is there. The, the concept's been proven. It's now just a case of maturing it and crucially pushing it through the procurement system much, much quicker than perhaps we would have done five, 10 years ago. The laser weapons themselves are becoming, um, you know, more efficient, uh, more compact. Um, in the U S army, they have deployed lasers on small vehicles, somewhere between a Jeep and a tank. Uh, they're on ships, uh, as you said, they've been thought about for aircraft. Um, and at the same time, you know, robots and autonomy, um, are continuing to be developed, uh, too. Um, but if you kind of follow what's happening with autonomous vehicles, um, you know, for people, right, autonomous cars, I mean, there's been some bumps in the road. It's not been smooth and, uh, but that's probably coming too. So I think that if you look far enough in the future, yes, we will have, uh, fewer people in the battlefield, you know, more robots, more autonomy, um, but hopefully this is done, you know, very, very carefully, right? Because uh, key decisions um, should probably in warfare always be made by people, right? And so, um, so yes, I think we probably are headed for a Star Wars future. There is certainly interest in the future in, um, you know, miniaturizing the technology, but also then making sure that we design our, our aircraft, for example, of the future to have the space and the, the power generation and transmission capabilities built in that they can integrate things like lasers in future once that technology is there. So the UK and Italy and Japan, for example, at the moment are, are building this um, new um, kind of global combat aircraft for the, the GCAP program. 
Um, sometimes the, the aircraft is, is called Tempest. And, you know, and part of the de sort of design parameters for that is building quite a big aircraft, much bigger than the, the current aircraft we have. So somewhere in some ways between a sort of fighter and a, a bomber of old. Um, and that's partly about having the payload so you can have you know, more fuel, more, more missiles and other things on board. You can go further, shoot more have more effect but it's also about making sure that you build the aircraft much more around things like the engines and the, the power management system so that if you want to add sensors in future or more computing power on board or things even like lasers there is the capacity to upgrade that aircraft and do it rather than it being something that you just can't physically kind of fit in to the bus of the aircraft and so absolutely we're seeing countries start to to think ahead to those sorts of questions and how they integrate these these systems um and and the same applies here obviously for things like ground vehicles as well you know there's a lot of or is constantly discussion about you know the long time long term kind of future and health of the tank but there's a lot of interest in things like how do you improve the defenses around the tank to make it more survivable in the battle space things like active protection systems we have at the moment but in future you could of course potentially have you know miniaturized laser or, or radio frequency systems that deal with incoming threats so you know the absolutely the, these sorts of weapons as they get smaller will will proliferate both in terms of their number in the battle space but also the sort of variety of ways that they're employed and the variety of systems vehicles that they're they're added to we should also remember space and all of this you know we already see um kind of lasers being used from the ground to uh, target satellites in, in space obviously in future you could also see you know growing use of of kind of uh space-based systems dealing with other co-orbital threats and then that really does get you into the sort of i suppose the sort of star wars kind of vision of you know space on space combat with lasers but it's certainly not as dramatic as you know as the george lucas movies and probably not quite as good a soundtrack either